Welcome to the summary regarding ISA for the regulatory environment in our syllabus. Now, firstly, from the regulatory environment's point of view, you know that we need to fulfill certain regulatory standards. So, for example, this the Companies Act, the Corporate Governance Code, the international standards related to the IFIs, International Financial Reporting Standards, and also international standards on auditing. Okay, so I saw things including the ethical codes. So these will be the elements within the regulatory environment there. Now, from a syllabus point of view, firstly, you will need to understand the audit committee. Now, from my perspective in this syllabus, that you need to know the audit committee, for example, the composition requirement will be at least three non-executive directors and at least one of them would be the financial expert. But more importantly, the audit committee will work with the internal and the external auditors. So this means that if you've got any problems, so for example, for the investor internal auditors, they found out any problems regarding its internal control system, they will need to report to those charged with governance, which means the audit committee. And from the external auditor's point of view, if we were to decide to qualify our audit opinion, we need to communicate these with the audit committee first before we qualify our audit opinion. So from my perspective, the exam technique regarding the external auditor, the easy mark for this uh, when we come to the audit report stage is that we need to communicate the proposed audit opinion with the audit committee before we do that. So that would be a very uh, key one easy mark that we can get. Now, after we've grasped this idea, the next thing will be related to the ISA. Now, the ISAs related to the regulatory environment, firstly, we will need to see a separate branch related to fraud, no class, no class stands for the non-compliance with laws and regulations by the client's company. And of course, a minor area related to this will be the money laundering. I will need to discuss about that later on. Now, the idea behind money laundering is that the origin of a client's money is not particularly clean enough, which means it's from black, black souls. So this means that the money may be coming from the crime source and the client may have its own ways to launder the money and to turn the crime money into a clean one. And of course, sort of standard related to the first branch or first area here will be related to the ISA 240 and 250. I'll be summarising these in very simple words so you can apply them in the actual exam. The second branch of the ISA is that when we use others' work. It's very important that in some circumstances that uh, from the external auditor's point of view, we can't do all the things on our own. So this is why we may be relying on, for example, the internal auditors of a client's company. So for example, we may be using its internal auditor's work related to the inventory count and cash count to substitute the part of a substantive procedure that should have been performed by the external auditor. At the same time, we may be using the expert's work in providing value for our inventory's work in progress, construction contract, uh, or perhaps the pension fund. Alternatively, we may be involving the service organisation. So, in other words, the client business activity related to finance may have been outsourced to the third party. The third party would be the service organisation. And it's very, very difficult for the external auditor to check the service organisational uh, procedures and its account. And this is why we may be relying on the service auditor to give us that report. And we'll see that later on. And of course, 
there might be a few ISA that we need to cover there. So for example, related to auditors, we'll be using the ISA 610, 620 for the expert. And also for the service organization, we will be covering the ISA 402 and also the assurance standard ISAE 3402. And in the exam, of course, using these principles, you can easily spot any questions, especially for its scenarios. And then you will exactly know the, how to apply this in the actual exam in very simple words. Now, firstly, I will be covering the first standard and the second standard because I will be mixing them all together, the ISA 240 and ISA 250 in one go. Now, Related to fraud, which means according to the ISA 240, related to no NOCLAR, which means the ISA 250, there are particularly four issues they have to know so you can pass this paper very easily. Firstly, from the management's point of view, what will be the responsibilities there? from a management's point of view. I would say that from a management's point of view, they would be primarily responsible for the internal controls. Now, the idea behind it is that management should be designing and implementing the internal controls effectively so any fraud and efforts and any non-compliance with the relevant laws, for example, the labour law and regulations in your industry can be spotted directly. And of course, it's the management's primary responsibility, it's the board of directors' primary responsibilities for that. However, we will need to see the responsibilities from the auditor's point of view. from the external auditor's point of view. Now, from the external auditor's point of view, I would like to use my own mnemonic for this. It's called RCSR, okay? When you're thinking about the responsibility by the external auditor, okay, I would say, ah, CSR, it's like corporate social responsibility, that kind of stuff. But these are not related to corporate social responsibility. Now, I would divide this into two stages. Firstly, would be the planning stage. Now, during the planning stage, from the external, external auditor's point of view, the first R stands for risk of material misstatement. So what we need to do then is to assess any room or risk of material misstatement related so, for example, your revenue, your expenses, your assets, liabilities and equity to spot any potential fraud related to that. So, for example, there might be an incentive for management to overstate the revenue in order to earn the bonuses related to the profit target. At all times, there might be an incentive for the management to overstate the asset value by not writing down its value, so for example, through the bad debt expense related to receivables and depreciation expenses or amortization expenses in order to uh, achieve a return on capital employed target and something like that. So making sure that ROMM assessment will be very, very important there. Now, the second C will be included in the first stage or planning stage here will be the compliance requirement. So this is particularly uh, important from my perspective is that the auditor needs to understand or to read the compliance requirement which means the uh, regulatory framework okay, of a client's company uh, at the planning stage to, to know exactly what sort of laws and regulations that the client's company needs to follow in this industry. The second stage here is where we're going to be 
performing the audit. Now, performing the audit, I like to use SR, okay, so the final two letters, say S and R. So firstly, we need to be skeptical at all times, which means in technical terms, it's called maintain professional skepticism. So by doing this, for example, inquiring with management, inspecting suspicious transactions, uh, and also perhaps to inspecting correspondence with relevant authorities if a client is completely sued by relevant authorities, for example, by customers, suppliers, or even the government. So we need to read up to understand the nature okay, of non-compliance with laws and regulations, perhaps. Okay, so very, very important in that. The final R standing for representation from management. To get management confirmed over these issues, okay? Written them down on paper and sign their names to make sure that all the information related to fraud affecting the account has been fully disclosed by the management to the auditor. And any potential and identified non-compliance with laws and regulations have been fully disclosed to the auditor as well. So making sure following the RCSR, okay, so these four sentences will give you enough marks to pass this paper regarding this area. Now, the third area related to fraud or uh, the no cut or non-compliance would be um, when we are finding out, okay, so we've got fraud okay or non-compliance within a within a business so how are we going to do about it okay so which means the auditor's point of view uh, related to our procedures now here i like to use another mnemonic for this it's called sample size and 3r so firstly the sample size and then r r r now, if I found out any fraudulent transactions happening within the business or any non-compliance with laws and regulations, firstly, I would like to increase the sample size to check more items to make sure that the overall effect on the financial statement to be within an acceptable level, for example. Otherwise, yes, we'll need to consider the implications on our audit report. But making sure the second R standing for report, very important there. So report to whom? So for example, reporting to management, reporting to the audit committee or those charged with governance, if you like. Sometimes those charged with governance will be the whole board. So make sure that you're ready for that. Or perhaps we may be reporting that to the group auditor as well. Okay, if, especially if I'm only the component auditor and even the relevant authorities or, or asking the management to report this issue to the government so uh, that would be very important though. Now another two R would be the audit report implications to see whether or not we should qualify our opinion especially if the errors in total will be reaching the material level and finally consider to resign as an auditor so make sure that sample size and RRR will be another mnemonics that you can use there. Now, the final area only relates to the fraud or the ISA 240. I'd like to use another colour here. It's the pre-assumption. So this will be an easy mark as always in your actual exam. If you can see the examiner's answer uh, when the fraud are discussed, okay, fraudulent activities are discussed in the uh, actual question, always with one mark with the pre-assumption here. Now, uh, from the auditor's point of view, our assumption would be we will need to presume the revenue recognition will be the high risky area. 
So the reason why this will be a case is because the revenue will determine everything. Okay? It would determine the level of profit, determining, affecting the equity figures as well. So if you haven't got any revenue at all, of course the target of, by the management can't be met related to the profitability target and therefore their bonuses may suffer. And, and this is why they may think of any uh, particular ways to overstate the revenue figure to a certain extent. So we need to watch out from the auditor's point of view. There's no point in saying in the actual exam that in the scenario, okay, I think we haven't got uh, many staff working in our audit firm, so we skip auditing the revenue part. Okay, so can we do that? Absolutely no. The reason is, according to the ISA related to fraud, you can say that, that we've got the pre-assumption here, is that revenue will be presumed as the highly risky area. So we need to audit that very carefully. Now, knowing these four areas, okay, related to the first bunch, will, absolutely, will be absolutely enough for you to pass this area. Now, within the first bunch here, there will be a minor area, which means the money laundering, that may be tested quite frequently in your actual exam. So let's revise the money laundering issues in simple words. Or you can sh short for it, ML, from money laundering. Related to money laundering, there are particularly three areas that you need to understand. Firstly, the stages of money laundering. And I'll be using my own mnemonic for this. It's called PLI or P-L-I. Now, after we understand the stages of money laundering, we need to know the offences. So, from the auditor's point of view, see in what circumstances that we may be sued. Okay, now I will be using my own mnemonic for this. It's called P Chris. It's time, okay, it's time now, Chris. Right, offences. It's time to act now, Chris. Now, my own mnemonics for this. And of course, the final area related to money laundering is with regards to the anti-money laundering procedures. So which means we need to do something in advance before we are sued. So we need to know those procedures I'll be using my own mnemonics for this again. It's called DROP, D-R-O-P. So making sure that we are ready. Now, firstly, the stages of money laundering. The first stage would be placing. Now, placing means the client's company is getting the crime money. Usually, the crime money will be deposited in the bank directly. So that will be the first stage of money laundering. And then the client's company will design lots and lots of transactions. So, for example, involving transferring the money from one country to another country's bank accounts using different currencies. Now, the second stage is what I mean by layering. So, which means by acting like a washing machine to layer the money from one direction to another. Okay, so, which means to transfer money through complex transactions. Now, the final I standing for integration, which means getting money back. Okay. So getting money back, getting the money back to buy other assets. So an example for this would be, for example, through tax evasion, the business has saved $1 million. Now, the $1 million is through tax evasion or bribing others or accepting the bribery from others. This would be a crime money. And then the money would be on its hand or perhaps deposited in the bank. And this is what I mean by placing. And then using that bank account's money to create a lot of transactions, for example, through M&A, mergers and acquisitions, to buy another company, which means transferring the money into others' bank account, to buy its company, it's called layering. And then after which, we'll be selling that entity to somebody else and get the money back. And this is what I mean by integration. 
So finally, you will buy something else to get the money back. Okay, so uh, that will be the integration stage. Now, three stages here. Regarding offences, in what circumstances the auditors may be sued? Now, firstly, is to tip off, which means directly or indirectly informing the client that you are under investigation by others regarding money laundering, you need to watch out. Direct tip off will be sued. Alternatively, indirect tip off. So saying to the client in an indirect way, I think the money origin will be a problem. Please watch out. So telling this to a client, of course, indirectly tipping off your client, you will be sued if you're caught out by the relevant authority. Now, the second C stands for you actually commit the money laundering activity for the client or helping client design the money laundering system. Quite a lot of systems that we can uh, uh, help clients to design uh, the money laundering uh, activities, how to launder their money from a crime one to the clean one. So, for example, uh, using different currencies or through MA, or perhaps using money to buy your own cars or transferring money to uh, another country's bank account. Uh, so, for example, that country may be registered in uh, Cayman Islands, so such places like that. So, very commonly, we will see that in practice, these transaction amount will usually be the round sum amount, okay, without any decimal places. Um, if that's the case, then you need to be very professionally skeptical about that and uh, raise the red flag, for example, and to make sure that you identify that particular transaction and audit up very carefully. Now, the legs are standing for the report fails. Now, if you find out any particular money laundering activities, report to money laundering reporting officer on a timely basis, very important enough. Now, the next I, okay, uh, standing for the internal control system, and the final S, so the internal control system in place in making sure that you have adequate internal control system to identify and report those money launcher activities on a timely basis. If you failed to have those internal control systems in place, and you will be sued because that would be one of the offences there. Now, finally, the anti-money laundering uh, procedures, okay, by the audit firm, very importantly, firstly, due diligence. of a client's company. So which means checking the client's company before you provide the service to that client regarding the audit. So for example, checking the shareholders register, the company address and the business activity where not is making sense and the place that the company is registered, uh, very importantly, that we need to look about that. Now, second one would be the record of a client's company. So making sure that you will keep those records at least for five years. So that would be a legal requirement there. And also the officer that needs to be appointed. The officer is called money laundering reporting officer. Okay. So that will be a senior person within your audit firm. That will be quite independent enough and senior enough. So if you found out or potentially suspecting the money laundering activities of a client's company, so report that issue to the MLRO directly and on a timely manner, and lock that down, and to make sure that the MLRO will be making decisions of what will be the next step, or perhaps to report that directly to the relevant authority, but it's up to the MLRO to make that decision. And finally, making sure that all procedures are known to others through training. So training all of your staff within your firm to make sure that they are aware of the money laundering uh, activities and the procedures to deal with that and not to tip off the client and that would be a very first step there. 
Right, okay, so so far that we've finished a couple of uh, major areas in your syllabus, okay, it's the ISA 240 and 250, as well as the money laundry. Now, I'm going to be stopping this section now, because in the next step of our section, we'll be recapping on the using works of others. Okay, so I'll see you soon. Bye for now. A, P, C, accounting for your future.